Dr. Augustus, shall we start the session? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. A very good evening to each one of you. On, on behalf of the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, we welcome you all for this exclusive session on how did some of the IT, BFSI, and manufacturing companies enhance productivity and reduced attrition of millennials and Gen Z? The session is organized under the aegis of HR and Women Leadership Expert Committee. BCIC expresses its special thanks to Mr. Prashant Srivastava, Global CEO, VMatter. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation to address at this session. Our special thanks to Mr. Pankaj Piparia for initiating this session, sir. Thank you very much. The HR and Women Leadership Expert Committee of the Chamber is led by Ms. Dr. Augustus Azaria, who is the Vice President HR Kenril, co-chaired by Ms. Anuradha of TBS Motor Company, Ramani Ganesh, Hirect, and mentored by Mr. B.C. Prabhakar, who is the President of Karnataka Employees Association. A hearty welcome to Dr. Devarajan, who is our Senior Vice President. Welcome, sir. I now request Dr. Augustus to take over from here. And before handing over, uh, on behalf of the Chamber, we express our sincere thanks to all the sponsors of our events, Mrs. Bueller, Fundermax, MTR, IAMPL, SDMIMD, Sona Group of Companies, TVS Motor, Vishwas Group, and Vipro. Thank you very much once again to all the participants for joining this session. Over to you, Dr. Augustus. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rupa, and uh, good afternoon to all. And, um, you know, it's a wonderful uh, weather out here in Bangalore. Um, it's kind of cold, misty in the mornings, and uh, just right for us to have this very important session on employee engagement. And this is a topic that is very close to my heart, and I'm sure it is top of uh, the page as far as CEOs and CHROs uh, go. And some of you who are here on this call uh, clearly have outlined that some of the discussions you had with me, uh, the importance of uh, bringing in employee engagement, but here is employee engagement with a strategic focus. And uh, how many times have we all seen that, uh, you know, that sentence which says, people are our biggest asset. And in all annual reports, most large companies, Fortune 500 companies, say people are our biggest asset. They are at the core of our business. And therefore, shouldn't we be listening to people in much more depth? Are people's voices in alignment with strategic objectives? So on and so forth. And of course, is if people are our greatest asset, we've got to go and put it out there in banner headline, and it should not be hidden on page 18 of the annual report. And today's program is to bring to you a wealth of experience on how employee engagement is now at the forefront of any business transformation. And to do this, we have uh, <clears throat> We have uh, Pankaj, and of course we have our uh, uh, our guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Srivastava. And uh, I have to tell you something about him. Okay, so while he has been an IAM alumni, uh, he has also worked in large consulting organizations. He's worked for one of India's largest uh, business houses as the CHRO. And uh, he has been a very innovative person and brought in strategy to the center stage. And strategy, like we know uh, in the famous words of Peter Drucker, okay, culture eats strategy for breakfast, he said. But uh, while that is true, you know, there is a culmination of culture, strategy, that should drive employee engagement and business transformation. And without much ado, I should also tell you that uh, we have got good support from Pankaj, who has brought this uh, to us. And uh, basically, Mr. Prashant Srivastava is also 
the founder CEO of WE Matters, which is the company that uh, BCIC has been uh, engaged with and bringing this program to you together. And um, he has also, uh, he's in the process of co-authoring a book uh, on this uh, typical subject, all right? So we are truly delighted to, to have Mr. Srivastava here with us, uh, Prashant uh, for, for you uh, on a first name basis. And uh, with that, we would start off by, uh, you know, also acknowledging Dr. Devarajan, our senior vice president over here. And before I go in uh, to ask, uh, uh, you know, uh, Prashant a few questions, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Devarajan to take a minute or two to share what his expectation is as one of the senior leaders of the TVS uh, organization. Sir, sorry to uh, uh, spring this yeah. on you, but I couldn't uh, no, 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 myself no. back. Good, good, good. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a uh, very interesting subject because the, the progress after COVID is happening in a very fast phase. In all the in all the areas, including automobile industry, the main uh, area which we are trying to concentrate is on the human resource. Uh, ensure that people retain people. Ensure that we are able to retrain many areas. The three things happening in terms of the the definitely Indian economy is going towards six trillion dollar. Definitely is on the on the progress fast. Government is supporting. At the same time, the the requirements of the customer is changing. So every customer is new now, n is equal to one. And definitely in terms of the main resource is the people. So how we are able to retrain because EV technology is coming in automobile industry very quickly. So new technology is coming in. But one more thing happening in many areas of mechanical, just wanted to give up uh, Prashant this, many people want to go towards the IT industry. So they don't want to come to a mechanical industry, which, which is definitely a difficult job to do. So we are trying to uh, force people to be retained and taken forward in our area. So I look forward for this. It's a, a very interesting discussion. And uh, there are a lot of problems, but I think there's a lot of opportunity where um, I, I like the way Augustus took it up, saying that uh, HR should come in the front, not in the back of our, uh, the, what you call balance sheets balance. and other areas. I think it's a very, very interesting thing. And um, like software, human wear is going to be the critical thing for all of us. Yeah, I look forward for the discussion. Thank you, uh, Gisus. Thank please. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Dev Rajan. Yes. So is are the CHROs in the driving seat of the business? OK. And are CEOs apathetic to employee engagement? I disagree there because we just heard uh, Dr. Devarajan in terms of what his expectation is. And uh, have companies improved the productivity and retention of millennials and Gen Z? And that's something that Prashant is going to throw light on. Can HR teams release their time, you know, from boring Excel sheets? Of course, you need it and PowerPoint pr preparations but rather focus on truly enabling, you know, hands on the ground, on a shirt sleeves approach. Prashant is again going to talk about it. And what are the latest trends in employee engagement? What is different that WE Matters is going to bring to the table? So with that, let me pass on the first question to Prashant. So Prashant, there was a time when CEOs were very serious about employee engagement and some of them continue to do. However, in the last 10 years, while they still believe in its, import, in, in its importance, do they still really act on it and why? Thank you, Augustus. Uh, you can call me Augie. Thanks, Augie, and thanks, uh, Dr. Dev Rajan. And uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Rupa and uh, the PCIC team for making this happen and inviting me. And uh, Dr. Devajan, your your expectation uh, I've noted down, and I'll try to do my best to uh, respond to it. And Augie, coming back to your question on uh, see, most CEOs are actually. Uh, serious about employee engagement, so I'm not taking it away from them. Uh, the only challenge is that uh, finally uh, CEOs are uh, paid for delivering revenue growth and profit growth. 
and the business schemes are aligned with the objective of revenue growth and profit growth so let me put it the other way around even if the ceo wants to drive employee engagement if employee engagement is not delivering revenue growth and profit growth the business leaders and business managers will not be keen on driving employee engagement and beyond a point uh, the ceos may not be able to push the business leaders and business managers because a rhetoric that uh, all of us as ceos and chairs have heard from business managers and business leaders that should we do business or should we engage employees now if that is a trade off my response to all the business managers was always that please do business if it is one of the two please focus on business because that is more important because if there is no cash the company will be bankrupt so you got to first take care of what is important that said uh, no why why is this situation happening this situation is happening because uh, we <coughs> had two wonderful models uh, gallup launched in 1992 and eon cuit's model launched in 1994 both are wonderful model i have huge respect for both the models i have learned everything from gallup and eon cuit uh, and their engagement uh, models uh that said what has happened is that in 92 94 uh the working population was 90% of baby boomers and silent generation silent generation are people born between 1925 and 1944 and baby boomers are born between 45 and uh 64 now these two generations are uh kind of uh, you know seven that time they were 28 and 48 years old now they are 78 years old and 58 years old right so silent generation is out of workforce baby boomers uh account for less than 1% of the workforce uh even between 2012 and 22 in 2012 gen z who were born 95 or later uh were not working because they were only 17 years old and the majority of the population was gen x and gen y gen y born between 1980 and 94 uh and still a lot of baby boomers but in last 5 6 years as gen z has entered the workforce and we analyzed our data and we figured out that all the surveys that we've done in the last two years if we take the analysis of the generations there so gen x is less than 10% gen y is 50% and gen z is 40% now the old models do not cater to the expectations of the new generations and therefore the impact on business is not seen and not quantified and therefore the problem is more with the prevailing models than with the line managers or line leaders we've got to demonstrate to them that you know, this really helps them improve their business performance so i'll i'll just share some research from world economic forum uh and i mean a lot of us in this uh gathering today are from all these three generations uh so pankaj and i certainly belong belong to gen x now these uh, these people the gen x guys grew up when there was license raj in india they were workaholic uh you know because there was scarcity and whatever they were getting they had to maximize and their main objective was providing for the family right they mm, were not born with technology but they uh, tried adopting the technology and therefore you see them on linkedin mostly and to some extent whatsapp etc the gen y uh, 
and gen x was typically the children of silent generation who was uh, born in uh, british period and to some extent they had either seen or heard of the whole slavery story gen y was born up uh, brought up by baby boomers who grew up in free uh, india and who was uh, who was uh, more uh, uh, who were more uh, uh, well off they saw the um, growth in free india etc etc so therefore gen y became very idealistic they saw the economic boom of the country and uh, they they were you know they were like don't teach me let me do it and you know they were more about having experiences and as they were growing they came across mobiles and mobile technology so they they were like pioneers and they they, they felt that you know genx is lagging behind and the, the, if you see their the social media preferences it's mostly facebook and instagram whereas gen z uh, was born with mobile they didn't know how anybody could live without mobile or google search engine or uh, you know wikipedia etc encyclopedia which was more gen x had gone into history uh, maybe gen y also used encyclopedia a little but gen z never used it uh, but what happened was that gen z was born brought up by gen x who had seen five decisions and therefore they saw their parents or their uncles or their neighbors or friends parents losing jobs going through financial crisis and therefore they are more pragmatic and unlike gen y they focus on saving money and they mostly on snapchat and instagram so that the three generations had very different hues during the their childhood as they were growing up and therefore they their motivators are also very different gen x needs empowerment needs now we we can go to the next slide pankaj gen x needs empowerment right they they more driven by compensation the saying knowledge sharing uh, you know learning and can everything be fair right now gen y gen z is saying this is kind of given uh, compensation i mean how can you get me to work without compensation and just the things are given uh, both the generations are driven by purpose but gen z also has a overtone of money and job security having seen recessions and job losses both love experiences uh, but gen y would want to be only mentored and not as only sorry coached and not mentored whereas gen z would want to be mentored the saying don't beat it on the bush tell me what has to be done and i'll do it right uh, gen y therefore is very collaborative whereas gen z is quite competitive so for gen y work is like their life but gen z is saying hey tell me what are my salary benefits etc etc and uh, what am i expected to do and i'll deliver so gen z is little more transactional because their uh, trust in employers is little lower having seen uh, what companies have done to people during this session so these are uh, some of the nuances which have to be factored in if we have to determine the um, determine the change uh, change in expectation and deliver to the change expectations and therefore drive impact on business and if it can drive impact on business if we can quantify i'm sure the business leaders and managers will be quite convinced uh, to drive engagement because that helps them perform and i'm sure then ceo will also have uh, have uh, a kind of uh, uh, incentive to work with business leaders and managers to drive engagement and if uh, all these people are committed to driving engagement chr though is no longer than an enabler 
because he understands the people issues and engagement issues he is can use these models to predict uh, future performance and retention and therefore he is as much a party uh, to driving business as the business leaders because as uh, uh, agi and uh, uh, dr devarajan like he said that there are only two resources financial resources and people resources almost all companies with their name in of what they salt in in any industry have access to financial resources so what that is no longer the competitive advantage so what's the competitive advantage competitive advantage people so if we can attract the right kind of people and if we can get the best out of them uh, that's what will ensure market share and victory and uh, in the market and that's where the uh, chro actually becomes a business leader rather than a people leader so i hope pogi i have been able to yeah. answer yeah, your question absolutely you know absolutely and we we keep talking about multi generational workforce right we have three generations in the workforce and it's so important to understand their expectations and therefore you know drive engagement around there so you have been a leader at gartner you have led as a chro for one of india's largest conglomerates from oil and gas to retail to name the sector they have been there so you have seen the entire gamut right of everything so tell me uh, each of your business units would have been an independent company typically right for the for the volume of business that you all would have generated so how have companies improved employee productivity and retention yeah so mm, no it is uh, there are two two nobel prizes one is uh, richard taylor in 2017 and one is in uh, 2002 uh, daniel colman and 2002 uh, both are psychologists who got nobel prize in economics uh, and daniel colman is was the first one first psychologist to get a nobel prize in economics and he demonstrated that two thirds of human product, uh, human uh, decision making is driven by emotional reasons rather than rational reasons uh, and uh, richard taylor demonstrated that uh, two thirds of human productivity is driven by emotional reasons rather than rational reasons right now this is contrary to the bernoulli's theory of rationality propounded in 1750 which said that human beings are 100% rational and most of our management science is based on the 100% rationality uh, theory right so this was a diametric uh, uh, uh shift or change uh that you know that is only nationality is only uh defining 100% uh one third and two thirds is uh, driven by emotionality or the emotional reasons and that's where we realize that eq is perhaps more important than iq and uh uh so that's what uh, you know the companies have leveraged and if uh, people are emotionally engaged they uh, perform better and they deliver better and uh, they go beyond the call of the duty if they are not engaged what what happens if they are rationally engaged and not emotionally engaged so they come to office at 9 am they do everything that they are told to do they check all the boxes and go home at 6 pm and one can't question them because they have done everything that they were told to do whereas those who are emotionally engaged they not only do what they are told to do they also understand what this what outcome will this these activities lead to and they own the outcome and they go beyond the call of the duty to deliver on the outcome 
So at a philosophical level, this is what uh, uh, we did with all the companies that uh, we had in the group or even the clients that we uh, are working with. And we have a case study of an NBFC, which I can share with you. Uh, with, uh, and you know, this is very easy to demonstrate quantitatively. Uh, in a sales driven organization because sales are numbers and uh, sales folks are measured on numbers and not on qualitative stuff. And it is easy to uh, easy for the arithmetic to take care of it. So this is the customer engagement on Y axis and sales team engagement on X axis and uh, basis high sales team engagement and high customer engagement. We plotted or low low, we plotted all the branches of this company in uh, in these four quadrants. And we said, you know, what is the average target achieved for the branches in the optimized uh, quadrant? And we found that 130% was the average target achieved. The range was something like 120 to 145%. So imagine even within this quadrant, if we move a branch from 120% target achievement to 145%, there's a 25% increase. But if you look at the bottom quadrant, the target achieved was 70%. And there was significant upside if at all we could move directly the non-performing into performing or optimized target uh, quadrant. Uh, it could have been like 85% growth. But uh, even if we were to kind of improve, improve them gradually and not all of a sudden, which will, which is the real case, which is what happened, it, it could still give uh, 25 to 30 percent revenue growth every year. And then, if you look at the left top quadrant, that's the risk zone, where people are either compulsive, the sales team is not engaged, but they're engaging customers and they are delivering 100 percent target. But why does this happen? Three reasons in different companies, different reasons or combination will apply. One, they're compulsive performers. And two, they have managers who are hard task masters. And three, uh, the organization is hugely process driven and processes drive people and people deliver uh, because they have to follow the process. So imagine the uh, PPO kind of environment, right? Completely driven by process. Now, uh, this is this zone because these are the people who are likely to attract. And if they attract, then these teams can fall into non-performing zone. But if we engage them, they can move to optimize zone and there's a 30% increase in them. And as well as the bottom right quadrant is concerned, this is a tricky one. Sales team is engaged, but they're not engaging customers and therefore they are not delivering. They're happy with themselves, they're happy with their managers, and there's a need to, they're already engaged, there's a need to push them on performance and drive performance a little harder, even if that means slight fall in engagement to begin with, but once they reach the optimized quadrant, the engagement will also improve. And, you know, these guys are only a shade better in terms of performance at 80% compared to non-performing uh, at 70%. And therefore, if they move to the top quadrant, the advantage or the growth could be about 65%. So on an average, if you take all the quadrants together, it's easy to drive about 30% uh, growth per annum by optimizing the emotional experience. And who's responsible for emotional experience? In today's context, it's manager, leader, HR, and employees themselves. And we'll come to that a little later, but let's focus sure. on Augie's uh, question on how yeah. companies have, have been able to do this. Now they've been able to do this by uh, ensuring that all these four stakeholders uh, do their uh, bit to uh, improve the experience of employees, continuously measure it, 
continuously understand what they are saying, what their trouble points or pain points are, and keep addressing through these four stakeholders. And uh, that should uh, deliver significant uh, performance. We've seen this across industries. Sales, as I said, is easy, but uh, we've seen this in power sector and uh, power load factor, which is critical to determine the profitability of a company that uh, really uh, uh, improves in the turbines or in the shifts of people who are engaged. We've seen this in uh, cement where kiln availability, number of days kiln is available during a year determines the profitability. And we've seen that between 300 when cement plants are loss making, 300 days of kiln operation, 315 when they break even, 325 when they make profits, and 345 when they make super profit. If we draw correlation between the kiln availability and engagement, it turns out to be 0.8 or more. So those are uh, in 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 uh, in the group that I was inside the group rather than outside because mostly I've been outside the group as consultant. Uh, the first thing in the first quarter of joining I did was I did an engagement survey. I took the operating profit of all the companies and I took the leadership engagement with the CEO and direct reports and I drew a correlation and it was 0.86. And uh, that was like uh, the, the icebreaker and uh, after that, whatever I suggested we do, we could do. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Prashant. So, so who drives this? Now, there, there have been quite a few moving parts out here, right? And also to quickly uh, talk about our audience. Our audience is drawn from large companies, IT, non-IT, manufacturing, automobile, process, uh, code sector, and uh, also small and medium industries as well as startups okay so uh, and and in a lot of the, these companies you know you don't have very large hr uh, resources okay so therefore there are shared resources so typically who drives this who drives the engagement who's in the driver's seat so basically the engagement is driven by leaders and managers and uh, we can go to the slide on correlation, correlation, correlation. Yeah. So, you know, typically Gallup said that manager drives engagement and we completely agree with them, right? Only thing that Gallup said that managers are the only ones who drive engagement. Uh, we say that managers are still very critical for the engagement. Uh, but in 1992, managers were actually the only uh, worldview of employees in any organization. Those days, the, there were 13 levels of hierarchy. Today, there's five levels of hierarchy. And uh, even, uh, even with the lower hierarchy, flatter organizations, leaders more reachable, and leaders more amenable to be uh, open to talking to people. There's also an impact of social media. Like today, with internal and external social media, any anybody can reach anybody. Uh, so, smallest employee sitting in Patna can reach the chairman through social media and raise a question. And if the question is not responded to, that's a response. Right. So. Leaders have started playing a very significant role in engaging or disengaging employees. HR, incidentally, also seems to be playing an equally important role. And that's where I was saying that HR has moved from being an enabler to be a driver, right? Uh, if you see the correlation coefficients of leader, HR, and manager, they're about the same. Unlike in 92, if this analysis was done, or even in 95 or 98 or 2000, uh, it would have been manager out and out, very high correlation with engagement, and uh, HR and leadership very 
low correlation. Now this could also be, this is a research on all the surveys done in the last three years. And a significant part of that period is uh, driven by COVID. And therefore, uh, it could also be some amount of impact of COVID. And we'll have to see over the next 12 months if this at all changes. Well-being is a new element that has come up, which primarily responsibility of well-being is on employees. Uh, HR or organization can enable well-being, but finally, people have to get up in the morning and run or walk or you know, they have to do the meditation and stay cool and calm and they have to do their financial plan planning. So whether physical, emotional well-being or financial well-being or social well-being, finally the role is that of an employee. Uh, when we started, this correlation was around 0 0.3, 0 0.35, now it's come up to 0 0.6. Uh, point, uh, anything which is more than 0.3 in behavioral economics is significant. And this well-being uh, moving up so quickly also could be because of pandemic. That said, if you see the top five drivers that used to be there in 2012, 13, 10, 11, versus the top five drivers today, the top five drivers to, uh, used to be career opportunities, learning, benefits, recognition, brand, and you know, every year, even before the analytics team came up with the analysis for the year in Eon Gert, I could tell them that you know, these are top five drivers. And I was bang on right because at the most the order changed and that too career and learning were always top two in India. In some other countries, career and learning was maybe a little lower, but still top five. I'm not saying career learning, et cetera, or recognition is not important today. They continue to be very, very important, but they're not top five. If you look at the top five in 2022, it's brand, purpose, people focus, business direction, customer centricity, and it's somewhat in line with the earlier question that uh, Augie had raised and I tried answering as, as to the differences between these generations, right? Uh, that said, Business direction and people focus could have some impact of uh, some impact of uh, Corona because during the pandemic, people were worried as to whether the business is moving in the right direction or will move in the right direction in future or not. Whether companies are people focused or they will sack people, they will cut compensation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so those two could have become important in the last two years. Uh, but if you look at brand, purpose, and customer centricity, these were these had nothing to do with pandemic. And hence, uh, largely, we can conclude that uh, there is a shift in the top drivers of engagement, and that is more driven by the change in generations and their mindsets rather than just pandemic. And therefore, leadership is likely to uh, continue, and HR is likely to continue to be as critical as managers, or almost as critical as, as managers, even in future. We'll anyway keep you updated with uh, the research in the next 12 months and uh, see why, if there are any changes. But this is uh, how uh, things have changed, and this is how. Uh, the ownership is now not unipolar, but I, if I may say quadripolar. So it's leader, manager, HR, and employees themselves. And that uh, really uh, is a serious shift and uh, requires a significant collaboration in the amongst all the four stakeholders if we have to create a engaged organization. Absolutely. I think the quadripolar is the way to go. But again, I, I'm just going to bring something out of context or perspective, but something which is very current. OK, and we've all read about it. OK, now, if you look 2012 and 22, brand is top, whereas brand was uh, stay on the chart, Pankaj, if you don't mind. 
Um, so brand was fifth in 2012 to its uh, top one 2022. Okay, now this brings me to this question that uh, the recent level of media interest that we are seeing in the workforce restructuring that is happening, be it Twitter or Amazon or various other companies, all right, big brands, okay? And then you say that this has got to be driven by leadership. So leaders walk the talk. So what happens here when leaders themselves, you know, do not seem to follow a guided process and say, hey, you turn your car back and check your email whether you should come to office. Now, there goes engagement. There goes walk the talk. There goes our leadership principles. There goes leadership style. So that's why I said this is very current. Uh, uh, and uh, Prashant, uh, I would like to hear from you on this. And then my next question to that is, we have a lot of numerical and qualitative stuff. And this is what I want to hear from you. Our people want to hear it from you verbatim. Perfect. So, Mm, no, thanks for bringing this up, uh, Augie. This is a very relevant and pertinent question. So whether it is uh, Twitter or any other organization, where, uh, where the principles of leadership and principles of engagement are not followed, uh, in the short term, they may see some results and positive results. But is that sustainable? And our observation and research has been that it is not sustainable. Now, somebody can pull it through for one year. Somebody can pull it through for five years or seven years. But uh, <coughs> beyond a point, uh, the law of averages catches up. And uh, the good people give up on these companies and the average and the mediocre uh, continue. And if uh, if you, and as we discussed already, that human resource is the competitive advantage. And uh, if, uh, if you do not have good people, if you're average people, then uh, obviously you've lost your competitive advantage. Now, I just recall there was this professor of, uh, uh, there's some question on great resignation that has popped up. I'll go through the question and try to answer. Uh, if you if you just, uh, I mean, if I just recall this gentleman, I'm forgetting his name. He was a uh, professor of strategy in I'm Calcutta. And I was uh, sharing uh, uh, dias with him in one of the seminars. And uh, he, he had by then retired. So he said, you know, he was consulting the chairman of a particular company uh, into, into uh, let's say, garments or textile or something like that. And uh, he, the chairman asked him that, you know, why is it that after putting in some 800 crores of investment, we still are number two and a distant number two, and the we're not close to number one yet. What is going wrong? Why are we losing to that brand? So he said, Mr. Chairman, the brand is not losing. Your brand is not losing to that brand. Your production engineer is losing to the production engineer of that brand. Your sales executive is losing to the sales executive of that brand. Your CHRO is losing to the CHRO and CMO and CFO are losing to the CMO and CFO of that brand and CEO is losing to the CEO of that brand. I said, no, that time I was 10 years younger and I didn't have the courage to tell him that, the, Mr. Chairman, you losing to the chairman of that brand. So finally, brands don't lose, companies don't lose, people lose and people win. Now, if you don't have the right kind of people, now here I'm tempted to recall Lee Iacocca, who said that the problem of Chrysler was that the primary incompetence led to secondary and tertiary incompetence. Now, if that was uh, so, 
So if we put these two learnings side by side, if the decline and challenge starts, and if the decline and challenge starts right at the top, uh, then you know we'll we'll soon see a company run by mediocres, which is likely to lose to competition. So that's uh, really answering your first question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prashant. Uh, was there uh, something else you wanted to add? No, I, I okay. think uh, I'm good with that. In sure. in case uh, there's this question by somebody in the audience, uh, uh, there is uh, Prakash uh, asking, does deal type of organization mentioned in lean minting organization by Frederick? Lalux has high level of uh, engagement. No, I am sorry, I am not aware of Teal. So you will have to educate me on that. Great resignation being a reality in India, even in top companies, believing in five drivers of 2022. Why is that? Now, so what do you mean by top companies? You know that you have to define now. Please understand that a lot of so-called top companies uh, did not and could not resist the temptation of laying off people during pandemic, and people had to take it. Right, cutting down salaries was still fine because you no, know, there was no money with the companies, so companies were cutting down salaries. But if people were laid off in difficult times, don't you think people have the right to the act? And uh, in terms of, you know, uh, I'm sure they, they had their own compulsions and they had no options. But look at it from people's perspective. You know? There were people getting infected, needing medical assistance, hospitals charging. You know, once somebody is hospitalized with COVID, so uh, the bill runs into 15 lakhs to 25 lakhs. And that time, people lose their jobs. So when it is their time to resign, would they resign or they will stick to a company? And there are companies who stood by the employees who uh, didn't sack them, who insured medical insurance and stuff like that. And uh, you, you don't see that much attrition there. And there will be some attrition higher than, let's say, 2019. But the way you have to compare is not attrition in absolute terms, but attrition relative to uh, industry. So let's say if industry is at 40% attrition, and if a company is at 15% attrition, when uh, let's say in 2019, the company was at 10 and industry was at 10, so that I would say, uh, say relative attrition of 0% to relative attrition of minus 25%. So, so I think uh, there, there are enough organizations uh, of both types and uh, you know, I'm still in business. They're all my clients, so I can't name them. Uh, but you, you know, you've seen those organizations. So, uh, so those who uh, engage them uh, are not, uh, hurt by uh, this designation movement as much as those who either disengage them or had to disengage them. But people are people and uh, perception is fact. Thank you, Prashant and Jai Kirti. Thanks for that question and uh, Prakash for your uh, uh, questions too out there. So uh, I'm going to go into the HR partner's role, okay? Now, what happens here is that HR goes through significant work whenever we are going to be doing these engagement surveys, right? We have to get a lead, leader, manager dashboard, scorecards, okay? There's huge action planning that goes. There is a comparative analysis that you have to drive across various business functions. And uh, all these things are heavy lifting, right? Is there a way that we can do it in a much more simpler fashion? Are there any enablers? Is there automation out there that is available for us to uh, do this grunge work? Thanks, Augie, mm, for this question. Very relevant again. 
thank you for highlighting this. So I recall we had about 10,000 employees and uh, we were working with one of the leading employee engagement uh, consulting company and they would do a survey and they will take about three months to give us the reports and scorecards. And we would take another three to six months to do the action planning. And when we went back to the CEOs with the action plans, and they would smile and say, no, what is this about? And they were, we would say, no, you did that survey nine months ago, uh, six months ago, and the, these are the results. Uh, our actions out of that survey and they would smile again and that was so embarrassing and we said no we've got to do something about it and uh, uh, no in in those American multinationals and I have nothing against them I've learned everything from American multinationals but the decisions are very bureaucratic and slow acting to the customer feedback is slow but and that's where a lot of startups have come up both in US and India who are agile and who do dance to the tune of the customers and the market. So what we did was we we kind of designed a model uh, where the outcome behaviors, we call them P5. Promoter and persistence are nothing but same old advocacy and loyalty. Unfortunately, unlike customers, employee Net promoter score of loyalty and advocacy does not result in business outcome because employees have limited number of times they can change their employers and even after do they do, they sit on their CV. The brand sits on their CV. So discretionary effort, which is perseverance and passion, peacefulness have very high correlation with business outcome. I'm sure after this presentation, a lot of uh, models will start uh, incorporating them, but so far across the world, discretionary effort, passion, peacefulness is not incorporated and hence uh, the hence we are able to correlate with the uh, business outcomes rather than uh, employees, uh, rather than others. And uh, then what drives these behaviors? So purpose is a very strong uh, reason for Gen Y, Gen Z, why they choose a company, why they stay with a company. And we've seen a very strong correlation between purpose and passion and very strong correlation between well-being and peacefulness. And therefore, then, since these drive business outcome, purpose and well-being drive business outcome, organizational engagement, you know, the careers and the learning and all of that uh, continues to be important. Uh, there's some new elements in organizations uh, engagement like stress-free environment, customer focus, uh, and leadership communication. And therefore the ownership, you know, just to simplify the whole thing, what we've done is that while we started with themes of purpose, well-being, and organizational engagement, we clubbed them into ownership at manager, leader, and employees level, and HR level, so that uh, there's no uh, there's no need to kind of create accountability and spend time in creating accountability that is pre-created. And uh, we also, through our portal, deliver deep analytics. You can download uh, PowerPoint reports. You can uh, uh, download manager and leader scorecards. And manager and leader scorecards come with uh, recommended action plans uh, for each team of each manager. And manager scorecard has the 10 drivers that managers influence and leaders have the uh, seven drivers that leaders control and manage. HR has nine drivers for HR and the eight drivers of being are the responsibility of employees. So each one has uh, their own responsibilities and scores cut out and most of them have a recommended action plan. We also populate these action plans on a portal and these port the, the action plans on the, these portal uh, can be reviewed by top management or skip level managers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, 
we can i mean they they can then ensure the implementation and all of this you know you close the survey at 6 pm and 6 15 pm all of this is ready so therefore you know and we have heat maps and we have all of that so that uh, obviates the need of uh, hr team to go through a lot of excel sheets and a lot of powerpoint creation and they they time is therefore freed up as agi had initially pointed out to do do more meaningful and impactful work uh, rather than doing work that machines and ai and ml can do and uh, that's uh, that's uh, what i think uh, uh, everyone in this industry should do uh, because we need uh, not just us doing this but a lot more players doing this because this market is huge the need is huge the demand is huge and a lot of players can coexist but this is what ought to be done to relieve the chr role relieve the c uh, the hr team and uh, relieve those uh, embarrassing moments that hr has with the uh, uh, business leadership and ceo and uh, and not just embarrassing moment but you know until let's say 2018 uh, we talked of booker times but everything was pretty predictable now we are living in truly booker times so if you going to wait for 6 months to start action something that will be truly outdated and obsolete you know and not just uh, the quantitative stuff we also have qualitative questions on what you like most and what you want to change and that we convert into face cloud and we also report verbatim so that all that data is available to line leaders to also understand the under, underlying reason since sagi you mentioned about the qualitative beyond quantitative and yes in emotions qualitative is extremely important not just the numbers uh, so we we uh, do that and we expect uh, all the players in the industry to do this so that uh, the people benefit businesses benefit and if you know we we made uh, some rough back of the envelope calculations that if we are able to cater to 1000 mid size companies with an average revenue of 1000 crores and average employee size of 1000 will improve the lives of million employees and 5 million family members these million employees if they are productive and as we demonstrated to a case study uh, and you no know, as i said you no know, even power and cement and every other place not just uh, sales driven organizations are benefiting from it uh, if we if we are able to get these 1000 employees to be more productive and they drive 30% growth in these 1000 companies we the back of the envelope calculation shows that a gdp can go by 1.5% and that will result in significant job creation and therefore we would want more than more players in the employee engagement space to try and do what we're doing and uh, that that should you know dr devrajan talked of uh, we becoming 6 billion uh, economy i think people of this country can make that happen people of this country can make that that happen if, if uh, why 1000 companies why can't we have 4000 companies going at that rate and why uh, a million employees why not for them 4 million employees being happier just free and productive driving this growth then if we if we whatever the government is doing infrastructure is doing etc etc and that growth is already happening but if we top it up by another let's say 4 to 6% that mathematically will take us to uh, the 6 billion economy that uh, we uh, ought to be uh, there that 6 trillion sorry 6 trillion apologies thank you <laughs> yes thank okay. you So, Rahul, I, I think uh, <clears throat> this makes our job so much more uh, uh, 
meaningful, right? Uh, the whether it is the word cloud out there or any of those cuts that you can do by people, by location, by BU, and and you know get the impact down to the business. But affordability, all right. End of it. Uh, two questions in my mind. One is, this is data. What about confidentiality of information, okay, and information handling because of the various data privacy acts, uh, both in India and, and uh, other countries that we operate in? Two, how affordable is it for us? And sorry, the last thing there is, can you share with us, you know, some companies, if you can't share names of the clients who are using it, at least the sectors uh, that are using this will be helpful, you know, to uh, more, more in terms of be it stated as an acknowledgement that here's what the industry is taking up, right? Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I'll first uh, deal with the data privacy issue. So we've created a system that is completely non-touch. So we uh, we take the demographic data from the clients, upload in the system, and launch this up. So we have to take the demographic data because there are a lot of errors that come up in the demographic data, and that has to be clean. We're trying to automate that also, and soon we'll get the client to directly upload it mm -hmm. on the server and the others will be pointed out by the system rather than human beings. But as of now, human beings point out the data, uh, the others, uh, though we've automated part of it. And uh, once we upload it, then human beings have no, uh, no way of touching the data. The survey is launched, the data is collected, the machine reads the data of the responses and the demographic and does the analysis. Uh, so that reduces the time, that reduces the cost, and that increases the accuracy and ensures confidentiality. What we are going to be doing now is we've figured out a system of self-linked generation. So soon we will not take the uh, names of the employees and email IDs from the clients. Uh, and if you take the names and the email IDs out, then the rest of the data is reasonably useless uh, because it cannot be associated with an end data. And with, with that, we will have kind of 100% confidentiality and anonymity. And then uh, we we have already GDPR compliant and CCPA compliant, uh, but we will then uh, be way above and we won't even come in the purview of GDPR and CCPA because we don't have individual data. Uh, so we'll be working on that, that uh, I think uh, in the next two weeks, we should be rolling that out. In terms of affordability, since we've reduced the uh, human touch of data, and therefore no quality checks required, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore uh, we've been able to bring down the uh, costs significantly. We've also kept our overhead costs low, and with the lower cost of delivery, we are able to offer because our purpose is to drive the GDP growth and the employee happiness and the uh, productivity of companies and job creation. We certainly want to make some money because we have got to pay our bills. Uh, we certainly uh, want to make uh, some dent in terms of revenue and market share, but that's secondary objective. And therefore we brought down the cost significantly. So. Uh, our costs are about, uh, uh, compared to any other leading player who will perhaps not provide as much as we can provide, uh, the cost will still be 60% of any uh, leading player. And that is because of the level of automation, uh, because there's a huge cost in creating that product. But once we create that and maintain that and enhance that product, that's a fixed cost. 
And as we increase the number of clients, we will be able to further break down the cost. That's, uh, that's on the uh, data privacy and affordability. What was the third part of your question? Yeah, clients. Uh, your clients. clients. So our majority of the clients are in three sectors, the industry, which is the manufacturing industrial or the manufacturing. So we have clients like, no, these are clients who permitted us to use their names. So all of the Raymond Group companies, Tata Power, DDL, Vedanta Group companies, uh, Mukund Steel companies, et cetera. We have uh, some clients, about a dozen clients in Africa. And we have uh, in banking financial services, we have the likes of ICSA Potential, the GFC, Nippon, Equitas, Fed Bank, et cetera. And uh, then we have uh, significant clients in IT and BPO space. So StarTech and Ages and Coro Health, Netco, Simplify Healthcare, et cetera. And then we have some clients in the startup space as well. Uh, that is taking off, which is still in infancy. But uh, I would say majority of the users have been <coughs> Uh, BFSI and manufacturing. BFSI where uh, the attrition is very high and manufacturing where the productivity issues are quite high. So those are the two uh, business cases that has led to significant growth. IT has recently started growing because of the great uh, resignation and all of that. Uh, so it has recently picked up in last say, uh, seven, eight, 10 months. And that also seems to be growing in terms of using. And I'm happy that uh, they're, they're following some of these things because they also employ a lot of people and they can also contribute a lot to the GDP growth and the lives of the employees. Thank you for sharing, uh, Prashant. That's an impressive list, okay. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go into the last question, but before that, I also wanted the audience to know that you are uh, writing a book, okay, and that is the uh, other two thirds of consulting is what you call. Do you want to give us a very quick excerpt from this book? And as soon as you're done with it, you have awards, I see. What are these awards? Can you give us some insight into those awards? And then we will go into the Q&A session. Thanks. So mm, the book is about uh, exactly what we're doing, is about how to make the whole world uh, stress-free and highly productive uh, workforce and contribute to the businesses in terms of their financial growth as well as to the countries. And the key elements that we are dealing is that, uh, well, at an overall level, this should be the objective, but what do you do at the ground level? What should managers do at the ground level? What should leaders do at the ground level? HR and employees do at the ground level? So that it becomes like a um, HR or even business practitioner's guide so that they don't need consultants and consulting. They can just read the book and follow the steps and uh, just do it because uh, we don't want companies to spend a lot of money on consulting. Uh, they should just read the book and uh, start implementing. Lovely. So Thank that was that. the first question. The second question was awards. So awards was never part of our strategy. We never thought that we'll do awards. So our purpose was to uh, was to drive productivity and retention through engagement. But uh, uh, friends like you, Agni, pushed us into doing awards because uh, they felt that uh, the award space has become highly commercial. So for us, it's not a business line, it's not a commercial activity. It's more of a service which we are investing in. And why we have how we have differentiated it, we call them uh, of the people, by the people, for the people. And employees decide. There are no qualitative stuff. 
no hr audit no culture audit uh, no judgment no jury employees are the jury they decide on how good the company is how good the ceo is chr is and how good the leaders and managers are and how good uh, uh, how good uh, the overall workplace is uh, and basis uh, and therefore we cover 100% employees we don't do a sampling we cover 100% of the employees as respect of the size of the company it's a cost to us we understand but we walked into it with eyes open and it is driven by the score from the survey either the employee engagement score or the leader index or the hr index or the major index which determines the uh, ceo hr or leader and manager awards uh, employee engagement determines the determines the uh, company award well being engagement uh, index determines the best companies in well being unfortunately unfortunately there were 40 winners this year but unfortunately only four winners in the well being space so perhaps there's a lot more focus that employees think companies have to do in the well being space uh, so that is uh, really we had only one edition so far which was the now the awards were announced on 30th september and we going to soon launch the second edition uh, and the awards will be again in september 23 and uh, yeah so that's really completely objective we can't do anything about it uh, the scores are what they are and they're transparently available for any kind of audit etc uh, so that that's on the awards which is more of a service to the corporate sector very good. Yeah, and I think recognition is key, right, to engagement. And uh, as you recognize those leaders out there, I'm sure engagement index will continue to grow. So uh, with that, uh, Prashant, uh, I'm just going to take a few questions. Uh, there is one on chat. And for those who'd like to ask questions, please put them on the chat. Uh, so there is one from Filtrek HR. Some managers think engagement is a waste of time. How to overcome this? Hmm. So this is uh, this is a problem which is uh, quite prevalent, and uh, it is uh, the same thing like you know, uh, should I do business and or should I do engagement? But now, I think uh, there are a couple of things that we like to do. One is quantify the impact of engagement on business at a team level. As I said, sales is easier, but we, if we could do it for a power plant and if we could do it for cement plant, I'm sure we can do it for any any company, any industry, uh, based on whatever quantitative metrics that they are measuring. And once you demonstrate that impact, most probably at least half of the managers uh, buy in and are working with uh, the CEO, the CHRO, the HR team to help uh, improve the engagement of their teams, which will result in better uh, business uh, target achievement for them. Because if the team produces better results, they produce uh, better results. This is number one, but not always this works. So then what is the second step, especially for the group where this does not work? Then uh, what I say is celebrate, recognize. So the best managers who are driving engagement and business both, recognize them, celebrate them, and create an enviable position, uh, reward them, give them some special rewards, awards, recognition, whatever. and. Uh, Make them aspirational so that the others follow uh, follow them. So first is more rational. You know that you engage people, you get business results. Second is more emotional. Make it more aspirational, right? And third is so Peter Drucker said that business decisions should not be taken out of fear or greed, but in reality, business decisions are taken out of fear and greed. 
and not just business decisions, but also individual decisions. And I'm not saying every company should do it, but I'll quote some examples from a Thai bank. Uh, this was uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s when this Asian tiger crisis had happened and the banks in Thailand were uh, going down. Uh, this bank is called Siam City Bank. And what they had put in practice is that they had categorized the managers into four levels of managers, depending on how engaged their teams were or disengaged their teams were. And they had given out blazers of different color for all company parties. So the best managers would wear blue blazers and the worst will wear a red blaze, blazer, so that was, I thought, humiliating enough, but I think they stepped, they went <laughs> a step further from just shaming. I was just naming to shaming, and I don't know whether they should have done it, but it worked for them. Uh, they got the red blazer folks to serve the uh, blue blazer folks in some of the company parties. So, so that is the third, so the rational, the emotional, and then the naming and the shaming. Uh, for those who uh, do not get impacted both by the rational and the emotional, uh, are uh, the three methods now. How much we should do, whether uh, Siam City did a right thing or wrong thing, I don't know, but they built such a strong business that they did not only survive the crisis, the economic crisis, but uh, 10 years later, I was talking to uh, a bank in India and they wanted to know if I could tell them what Siam City had done because they, their uh, performance, business performance was quite exemplary. Uh, so that, those are the, those are three ways that one can look at convince okay. the managers that this is important. Yeah, thank you. Also, the managers are uh, loaded with so much of people management responsibilities. Plus, they are responsible for business results, and therefore, you know, there is uh, inadvertently a uh, priority that comes in, right? Saying that okay, this is high priority. This is not high priority for me. So somewhere I think it's the role also of HR leadership and the business to say, look, Mr. Manager, this is a very important aspect of your job. You must get this feedback. You must look at the engagement index because this is uh, meaningful to the business. So, so with that, I think uh, that was a good question. If there are no more questions, um, I would like to uh, turn it back to Rupa and, uh, and uh, also, uh, for those of you who are new to BCIC, you know, uh, we are a chamber, we are a go-to chamber with about uh, close to 700 uh, companies we represent and uh, also in the forefront of influencing the government on public policy and committed to employment generation too. So uh, if you're not yet a member of BCIC, uh, uh, please write to Rupa or anybody out here, and we'll be happy to share with you what we, how we can help you as a trade organization. So with that, I would also like to, uh, you know, welcome, uh, I think I saw Anapurna, um, Anupama, oh, wait, let me see. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for joining, and also my co-chair out there, Anu, thanks for joining, and uh, turning it back to Rupa. Thank you, Dr. Augustus. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prashant Srivastava. That was uh, quite an uh, exhaustive and uh, interactive session we had today. Thank you once again uh, for addressing our members, sir. We look forward to have many more similar sessions in the future with the Chamber. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pankaj Piparia. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thanks, Rupa, and thanks.
Uh, Dr. Devarajan and everybody over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank thanks. You. Thank thanks, you. Audience, thank for you. listening thank to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thanks a lot.